Well, greetings, printing enthusiasts. My name is Vicki Soma. This is Teagall 3D. Today's episode, I thought I'd give you a tour, not of my workspace, but of my 3D printed houses. This episode is going to be light on the slicing settings, but it's going to be heavy on my design process, my design thinking, my design guidelines for making little 3D printed houses. Now, they say writers should write what they know. Perhaps 3D modelers should model what they know. I live in a small town called Occoquan, Virginia, which is in Prince William County, Virginia. It is just south of Washington, D.C. And all my little buildings come from Prince William County, Virginia. So far, I've done, I think I started off with the Millhouse Museum, which is a free museum in my town, going over some of the history. The next one I did was the Rockledge Mansion, which is actually where my sister got married. It is a historic mansion in my town. Finally, this one's actually my reigning favorite. This is my childhood neighbor uh, commissioned me around December to go ahead and model and print uh, her house that she grew up in to give to her siblings and her mother. One thing all these houses have in common is the process always starts the same. I start with reference images. I get out my cell phone or my camera and I go out there and I take pictures of different angles of the buildings. All of these models were done in Blender and they all pretty much start off with a base cube. Uh, one thing you can do in Blender is you can add an object into your model, it's called an empty. And the empties have a whole different uh, variety of things that they can turn into. And one of the things you can do with an empty is import an image. Uh, with the empties, import my reference images, I can scale it to make it the size that I want for my model. Uh, I can make it translucent so you know I can use it as a reference as I'm uh, taking my base cube that's going to end up being my house, my structure, and I can scale it and just use that as a reference point. The key, the heart to these buildings is the detailing, the windows, the railings, the dormers, the chimney, chimneys. The detailing I've attacked two different ways. Um, this is going to get a little geeky on the 3D modeling side. For the Rockledge Mansion, I sort of did it a very formal way where the windows themselves I, are part of the cube, that, that the, my base cube of the building. So um, uh, if you want to Google the kind of terms that I was using, uh, it would be mesh modeling, it would be loop, cut, and slide to uh, add vertices where my windows were going to be, uh, subdivide to subdivide my little window faces into individual panes, uh, extrude to extrude out my details. You know, I don't know. Uh, and what I've actually ended up preferred doing is I will model my detailings as separate models. So I will have my cube for my base shape of my house. And then I will start a new object for my window. Uh, one thing I love about this is I can copy and paste. And now what I'm also doing is I'm exporting elements from other models to new buildings. So for example, uh, the little outdoor lights here in the Rockledge Mansion are the same outdoor lights I use in my neighbor's house. The railings here for the Rockledge Mansion, the same railings that are here in my neighbor's house and also the detailing on this screen in perch. So it does make it a lot easier for copying and pasting. Now as far as joining all those models together uh, to make a nice clean STL for your slicer, uh, there's a variety of ways to attack that um, and you can also be lazy and use repair tools, which I, I tend to do sometimes. Um, that might be a whole other topic for a whole other video if you're into those kinds of details. With the detailing, I tend to stick to 0.3 millimeters or 0.5 millimeters raised off of my building. Uh, that I'm using a 0.35 millimeter nozzle or a 0.4 uh, millimeter nozzle and I found that that detail and I could have those kinds of 100% overhangs and it's going to handle it without supports. And you could do a little bit of variety. So my neighbor's house, uh, the windows, the, the actual panes of the windows are risen up 0.3 millimeters. Um, when you get to the shutters, they're 0.5 millimeters off of the base. I do have a tip. 
a, something that's part of my workflow is slicing as you go, particularly when you're getting into these smaller details like window panes. I did not do that with my Millhouse Museum, like one of the earlier buildings that I did. This model was originally printed by Shapeways on their full color gypsum powder, their full color sandstone. In that rendition, because they're super fancy industrial printers with high resolution, my window panes came out great. When I went ahead and translated it over to my FFF printers, you could see the vertical panes. The printer actually skipped because they're so thin. It's like, oh, why bother? So when I did subsequent buildings, when it came to the Rockledge Mansion, this is something I made sure to check out as I went. I modeled what I wanted my windows to be and I went ahead and sliced it. It didn't quite look right, so I made some adjustments. And I was able to do that before I went ahead and applied it to the whole building. Now, if you do go to all the trouble of modeling a building and you see some detailing is not translating well to your slicer when you're looking at your slicer preview, for example, on my Rockledge Mansion, there is an anomaly on my back stonework. I pull it in Simplify 3D, I slice it, and patches of it are not working. There you might have a hack. You may have a way to redeem it. Uh, you can go ahead and look at the, um, the other settings. There is a horizontal size adjustment. So if I plugged in 0 0.10 millimeters of adjustment there and I reslice it, then all my stonework is showing up. And of course, if you're not married to the exact size of your model, you can always scale it up, make it a little bit bigger so your detailing does show up. Windows, doors, those are all pretty straightforward. Mostly they're cubes that I'm just messing around, mucking around and um, um, making them look the way I want them to look. The outdoor lights, uh, these are not exactly true to life. If you go to the side of the lights, if you look in the model, I've actually added a 45 degree angle um, to the bottom of the lights. And this is to help with overhangs. This is a hack I use commonly. Uh, if you look over here, there is a bay window. And of course, I do the same thing with the bay window. There's a little bit of an angle there um, on the carport of my neighbor's building in real life. The screened-in porch comes out over the carport, so I threw in a little bit of a triangle there to try to give it extra support. Railings and posts, uh, really, you know, these are not exact of the railings of the building. I went ahead and took an artistic license, and what I was going for here was I wanted to make sure it was something that wasn't too delicate, that was going to support itself. Uh, I ended up with these little tiny railings. I think it was point, I'm going to cheat, uh, 0.65 of millimeters and 0.85 millimeters. With the actual posts on my neighbor's house, uh, this was a little bit of a, a different case. I wanted to make sure these were stronger, um, particularly since they're going to be connecting over to awnings. Uh, that I went ahead with two millimeters thick um, to make sure that there is some good support there. The awnings, I wanted to print them without support. The little hack there is on my supporting posts, I actually have connecting rectangles, um, we'll call them support beams, that are, um, that get printed first before we get to the awning itself. And what this does is it forces the printer to print some uh, perimeters between all the posts here. And when it gets to the awning itself, it has ample foundation to do bridging. That worked fantastically. The only place that I had to do supports on this print was the little cardboard. What I think makes these pieces are the textures. With these textures, there's more than one way to skin this cat. I actually do it um, using intersections. Uh, a couple of videos ago with the pokey stops, I talked about the power of intersections and I had the Venn diagram of people who like hiking and people who like 3D printing and I was right smack in the middle. My textures here is the power of intersections. Um, what I do is I, and I have a blog post where I detail this step by step. I'm just going to go over sort of high level of what I do. But the first thing I do is I make a template of these faces that I want textures to be part of. For example, on the Rockledge Mansion, 
I don't want stonework where all the windows are. I don't want stonework where the doors are. So in Blender, using a combination of duplicating vertices and separating them out, I ultimately make a little object of what I want textured. So in this case, it is the front part of Rockledge, but without any of the windows or doors. I also have objects for my textures itself. For the stonework, I was a little bit of a purist. I actually took a reference image of the Millhouse Museum, a historic building in my town, and I used Bezier curves to trace out those stones. It was probably a little bit of an overkill. And there's a lot of ways to skin this cat. You could find images of stonework on the internet and make a scalable vector graphics, maybe an Inkscape, and use that to make your object so you could do it a lot faster than I did. For the shingles, for the brick, for the siding, I took advantage in Blender of what's called arrays. So I would model one brick and then I would add an array modifier and make it a row of bricks. And then I would add another array modifier on that and make it a whole like, grid of bricks. So I would have this one model that's the face that I want to make textures out of. And then I have a model of my textures, so in this case, the stonework. And what I would do is I would take the intersection of both of them. And there I go. I have some nice little textures to add to my model. I have a number of pieces where I would go to the trouble of making shingles uh, for the houses. Uh, even on the Rockledge Mansion, I'm adding shingles to the little dormers and everything, being meticulous. It was my last piece, my neighbor's house, that I finally caught on that maybe I could be a little more efficient at it and take advantage of layer lines. When I was doing one of my slicing as I go to check my details, I happened to notice in the slicing preview that the layer lines kind of look like shingles. So in my neighbor's house, I never actually applied shingles. I just let the layer lines make that effect for me. Well, that's today's episode. Thank you guys for watching. I hope you enjoyed my tour of my 3D printed houses. Maybe this gives you an idea of some houses or structures that you want to try to 3D model and print. And if you don't have the time for 3D modeling, hey, it might be something I would enjoy. If you have any questions, go ahead and comment down below here on YouTube. You can reach me on Twitter at TGAW. I have a 3D printing blog, which is at www.tgaw.com. Thanks as always for watching. I hope you have a fantastic day.